The word truth as we use it in the English language actually means the fact about a thing, the truth of the matter. When we try to use it in a completely isolated way, when we try to apply the term truth to an absolute condition in which we cannot expect any direct interpretation or explanation, then at least theoretically the term signifies reality as experienced in illumination. Truth is therefore actually, in the most abstract sense, complete truth knowing. As far as we are able to judge from our perspective, there are very few human beings recorded who actually can be said to have achieved truth knowing, for it would imply the total absence of any element of error. And it would also imply that the individual possessed the capacities and the powers necessary for the perfect apprehension of a matter. Therefore, most persons use the word poorly from a semantic point of view. We can look around us on a rainy day and we can say the truth is it is raining. We will not be contradicted. But this kind of truth has a very little interest to philosophers, mystics, and idealists in general. When a truth relates to the obvious, about which there can be no debate, discussion, or conflict of opinion, then perhaps a better term would be fact. Many things are factual. Facts can be sometimes quite inspiring, but for the most part, facts are not stimulating because they are obvious and because they relate uh, to comparatively dead matters. We can accumulate facts forever and achieve thereby an encyclopedic type of mind. But these facts seldom make us happy. They seldom inspire us to greater personal effort. They open very few doors of insight or understanding because facts themselves are for the most part static. They do not challenge. A fact is a thing about which there is so great an agreement uh, that there is practically no need for further exploration of the matter. We like to think also of reality as often a synonym for truth. Reality, of course, is actually not a matter of perception. Reality is the nature of the thing as it is. A reality can exist without our being aware of it. It can exist entirely apart from our comprehension. Therefore, in religion, reality is often assumed to be the highest uh, kind of state or condition which the mind can conceive. Reality is, in substance, the unchangingness of things. Reality is the core fact, but it is more than a common fact. Reality is the actual nature of the thing, usually as opposed to the concept of illusion. Illusion being a seemingness, a thing as it appears to be, 
And when we say appears to be, we generally imply that it is in this way recorded by our own sensory perceptions. Appearances can be perceived by our faculties, by various instruments of thought and scientific procedure. But appearances are not necessarily, necessarily real. Therefore, against uh, reality, we have illusion, which is the appearance, the fantasy, which is not real. Reality can perhaps be applied to the divine nature. If we are theists, if we believe in God, then we may assume deity to be the ultimate reality. If we are atheists, then we must assume that the illusion of deity, having been dissipated so that we no longer believe in deity, then this unbelief becomes truth or reality in the abstract thinking of man. So reality must be the thing as it is. If the atheist believes that the universe is without a spiritual factor, then for him reality is this absence of a divine being. Against reality also we have the vast creation of appearances which make up life. And today in learning there is this endless struggle between truth and error between the fact of the thing, the reality of the thing, the undeniable nature of the thing, and the conflict with that which is of appearance only, or as the classical Greek uh, referred to the situation, the nature of being is the reality, the nature of seeming is the illusion. Now, in every phase of life, strangely enough, we live in a world composed of partial truths. We live in a world of facts that are not sufficient, realities that are not discoverable, truths that are not at least immediately knowable. Thus we live in various degrees of the factual universe uh, as it is abstractly defined. We know that governments, policies, philosophies, science, sciences, arts are all in the process of becoming. We cannot assume that any area of knowledge is as yet perfect. Perfection of knowledge is simply the exhaustion of ignorance. When there is no ignorance whatsoever about a situation or a fact, the fact itself is clear. This is the Buddhist point of view. The Buddhist takes the position that man can never actually uh, storm the gates of reality. He can never proceed step by step possessing more and more of reality. Actually, the human being does not attain reality by a direct road. If he could have done so, he probably would have long ago. But reality is the, is the condition that is to be found only by the gradual exhaustion of unreality. For a long time, men believed the earth to be flat. And uh, they made a great step forward when they discovered that it was not flat. Now what they really did was to recover from ignorance. They stepped forward one degree beyond the previous generation. They discovered something that was not so. And the thing that was not so was that the earth was flat. This is not so. So by gradually recovering from ignorance, they achieve the state of knowledge. The reason this is difficult is because ignorance is itself 
a kind of knowing. It is a knowing of that which is not so, but it is still a kind of knowing. And no one is more certain than the person who is tied tightly into one of these patterns of wrong knowing. The enlargement of knowledge must always result from the acceptance of the fact that we are wrong. And this is where the complication becomes very difficult. We must outgrow error. To outgrow it, we must recognize it and depart from it. And because our lives are tightly involved in little patterns which contain large elements of error, we are constantly challenged uh, to depart from traditional, acceptable, long-held, long-believed uh, convictions. And we are inclined to be reluctant. A reactionary is therefore actually a person who clings to a previous standard of knowing. And a progressive is one who perhaps tries to go forward, but of course may likewise be wrong. The reactionary is wrong because he affirms one attitude. The progressive can be wrong because he may live only to deny the reactionary attitude and not have any closer perception of the reality. It follows from our common and general experience, therefore, that we live in a world in which what we call truth and error are bound together in a most complex way. For us, in this sense of the word, truth can only mean the reality of the thing, and ignorance the lack of the knowledge of this reality. Actually, no ignorance is absolute, and as far as we are concerned, no knowledge is absolute. Consequently, every uh, pattern of research that we carry on has in it a certain amount of truth and a certain amount of untruth. Very often the chemistry and the combinations are so complicated that we are unable to disentangle them. Thus we continue to cling to errors, even supporting them by the partial truths which we have already achieved. The individual who follows this pattern naturally has certain difficulties in his life. He arrives at conclusions with the aid of faculties that are partly right and partly wrong. If he is right in something, he likes to think he is right in everything. And when he is confronted with one of these problems, if the issues are somewhat abstract and his error is not immediately obvious to him, he is still inclined to cling to the error and assume that other people are wrong. Thus the mind itself, being immature and undeveloped, has neither the courage nor the insight to correct itself. And we plod on down through the centuries, uh, to trying to move forward heroically and at the same time held tightly uh, in errors uh, by our imperfect faculties. The ancients also held it to be tr also, uh, true uh, that many errors are sustained because they are convenient. The individual finds that truth is frequently opposed to his own personal likes and dislikes. Whatever the natural fact of the matter may be is not always what the individual hopes it will be, wishes it to be, or requires it to be. Thus there is a war on almost constantly between the immature faculties of man and their pronouncements and the larger realities of the patterns of existence and their requirements. The person is therefore unadjusted. Unadjusted means that he is not living by the same code as the world in which he exists. He is not intentionally disobedient. He simply lacks the insight which permits cheerful and immediate obedience. 
What are the causes for the continuation of error in the world? The causes are, first of all, ignorance. For where ignorance exists, uh, error is almost inevitable. Then there is a compound kind of ignorance which may be termed stupidity. Stupidity is the individual who, having the capacities to arrive at certain insight, or perhaps having actually recognized realities, refuses to accept them because they are inconvenient. Consequently, stupidity can only exist where the individual is doing less well than he knows. To live below our own level of capacity is stupidity. Both ignorance and stupidity can arise from, or in turn, give rise to selfishness. Selfishness is self-interest. Self-interest is nearly always at variance with universal requirement. The individual, therefore, who is self-centered is depending for his survival, for his insight, for his maturity upon the weakest of all elements, himself. The wise person is not self-centered. He would like to believe that he is truth-centered. And he uh, probably realizes that in a conflict between himself and truth, he can only advance if self loses and truth wins. But in many instances, the individual does not wish to face a decision that is so formidable. There are, of course, many pressures uh, that assail the truth seeker. He very often does not have the courage or the discrimination uh, to pursue his search with the constant and irresistible determination that can lead to ultimate victory. The enemy of truth in every instance is error, and error is most obvious in this world, in the various institutions which it creates. Now, error is not malicious always, perhaps very seldom is, but error usually has to survive by a kind of stubbornness. The person who is wrong almost immediately brings himself into an unhappy relationship with reality. The wrong person, or the person who is wrong, begins to suffer. Things go badly. The various structures that he builds do not operate correctly. The various institutions which he founds fail of themselves in some respect. His business goes bankrupt because of the error in his own understanding or insight. He loses his family because of errors within himself. A system under which we live, such as a culture, may produce generation after generation of misery. But if we have not the wit or courage to realize this, then we have to continue to suffer. When things go wrong, there is something wrong with the patterns that administer them. An individual cannot be right all his life and be miserable all his life. A civilization cannot fall as the Roman Empire did because it is right. Something has to be wrong. Now in life, every time we make a mistake, we are jogged, but nearly always we neglect the warnings. We do not recognize that the difficulties that arise are the result of the fact that we are practicing an error, that we have a mistake of basic judgment, that something we are doing is inconsistent with the truth of the matter. The one thing that the Greeks discovered after a certain period of mentation, they gradually developed their philosophy is that everything that exists has an archetypal pattern. 
This is true not only of animate things, but of inanimate things. Not only the works of God and nature, but also the productions of human ingenuity. Now, everything has rules, and these rules operate if they are followed and obeyed. A plumber has to follow rules, or the, pl the plumbing in the house will not function. The electrician has to follow rules, or he may short-circuit an expensive system and destroy himself. Everything in nature, or produced by human ingenuity, has a better and a worse way of being done. Everything that is created by nature is created naturally and with the law as a primary consideration. But nature is not perfect. Nature is creating under law also. And the law under which nature is creating is the law of evolution or the law of causality. We know that nature makes mistakes simply because nature is working with elements and materials that are themselves imperfect. But when na nature does make a mistake, nature very quickly corrects that mistake. For the mistake itself in nature does not survive long. Man, however, has discovered various artificial means of perpetuating his own mistakes. He can bolster them up. He can fortify them in various ways. If he has a bad law, he can amend it. He can create new uh, regulations to support a basic regulation that itself is wrong. Ultimately, this will result in a pyramiding of corrections, and at last the whole thing will collapse. So in the uh, development of all things which man does, there are laws which, if fulfilled, bestow a measure of survival. But according to man's own development, nothing that he can create today is perfectly done. Therefore, nothing that he can create is eternal. The fewer the errors, the longer the survival, or the more completely the device will function. If, the man, if man is able to create a better government, it will last longer than a poorer one. If man can discover a better remedy for an ailment, the percentage of recoveries will be greater. But man cannot as yet create the ultimate remedy for anything nor can he fashion any institution that is immortal. The reason being that his imperfect insight will not allow him to be right in everything. And wherever his dream, his creation, his invention, his institution exhausts its realities, it begins to be undermined by its unrealities, and so finally falls. This is not wrong, but it is, we might say, inspiring to modesty. It causes the person to realize more and more that he lives in a universe of incompleteness. If it was not for incompleteness, our scientists would not be continually trying to find new solutions to things. Our philosophers would not be complaining about the fact that our higher reasoning processes are not adequate. Our religionists would not be trying to save us forever from sin. And our politicians would not be forever exploiting our ignorance. All of these situations point clearly to the imperfectness of things. We are all weak in the area of our errors. We are all strongest in the area of the degree of realities or truths which we have achieved. Now, man is confronted with two problems which also um, concern him. The first is, how can he make the greatest adjustment at this time 
between his realities and his unrealities in order to live to the maximum of his insight. How can he live to the full degree of that part of truth which is known to him? The answer, of course, theoretically is that man would have to live the highest known standard, that which is the most completely enlightened pattern of existence which he is capable of understanding. This, in turn, would require that the individual would have the insight necessary to determine that which is the highest pattern. We have today in the world many different patterns of ethics, morality, religion, culture, philosophy, psychology. Each of these in its own small world feels not only its uniqueness but its superiority. Thus, there is no agreement, actually, as to what is the best pattern. The reason there can be no agreement is that there is no mind yet capable of the complete discovery of the best. All minds are working gradually from the worst toward the better, but nothing has achieved the best. Also, if by some chance we might assume that an isolated person should achieve the best, then we would be confronted with the fact that no one else would understand him, simply because they cannot understand more than they are. To discover that which is the, best, the better or the best of the known or the attainable means that something has to be done to the mind itself. We know, for example, that the mind of man is an instrument of comparisons. Some of the older scholars believe that the human brain was divided into two uh, lobes in order that on the two sides the various powers of the mind might be uh, heralded or arranged in battle array to fight with each other. In other words, the armies of thought were drawn up facing each other as upon an ancient battlefield, and the mind fought it out uh, in terms of the balanced competitiveness of the halves of the brain. We're not quite sure that this is so, but it still remains that the process takes place, whether it has anything to do with brain structure or not. In man, there is a continual warfare on the basis of his own competitive estimations of things. He thinks in terms of polarities. He thinks very largely in terms of Aristotle. He says to himself, if this is good, that which is the opposite of it must be bad. If a certain thing seems to be true, then the opposite of that must be untrue. So we create these competitive patterns. If one person's music is good, another type of music is bad. We know this is not quite true. We know that there are many kinds of music that are appreciated by different peoples. One evening I happened to attend a concert in which a, an Indian music, East Indian musician and an American soprano uh, constituted the warring team. Uh, each one appeared on the program in high conflict with the other. To the East Indian person, uh, the American soprano singing was utterly incomprehensible. They could only explain it as noise full of holes. The reason it was full of holes was because it had pauses unknown in Oriental music. Uh, the Oriental finds some way of breathing without stopping his tune, either by means of his background instrumentation or something. There are no pauses such as we know. To the Western soprano, the Eastern music was equally incomprehensible. The quarter tones and the eighth tones had no correspondences in our system, and there was actually no understanding likely to create appreciation. 
Each was functioning from the concept that their own was good and that the opposite simply could not be good. We do the same in philosophy. We do the same in every branch of learning. If a certain thing is accepted, something else is not accepted. And most of our acceptances and rejections are on the basis of authority or tradition. So that the individual does not experience much for himself, calling upon various available resources to support an attitude. He tries, perhaps, to be honest, but he cannot be honest about something in which his knowledge is inadequate. He simply has no appreciation, therefore no inclination to weigh honestly that which he does not appreciate. This means that all through the world and all through life, uh, the person is combating that which is not his own with the courage and strength of his own acceptances. What we call truth and error, therefore, can often be merely acceptances and rejections. Acceptances based on similitude and rejections based upon dissimilar uh, conditions or dissimilitudes, things that are different. This means that the person who is trying uh, to find out the values of a thing has to gradually arrive at a non-Aristotelian point of view. He cannot assume that his own point of view has to be right. He cannot assume that his own acceptances have to be the standard of right. He cannot continue to divide the world, creation, existence, into two structures, himself and everything else. He cannot divide it into uh, two patterns of acceptances and rejections. He has to take the ground that acceptances are familiar, but that no individual has the right to a rejection unless he has insight into the realities involved. And the more we become aware of the realities, the less certain we are and the less dogmatic we become in matters of rejections. We become more tolerant, more understanding, more appreciative as insight enlarges. The Eastern system of thinking points out that the only way in which you can get away from polarity is to reestablish a unity, the Pythagorean monad, or the one. And do as Pythagoras did. Consider the one the symbol of truth and the two the symbol of error, inasmuch as the one is indivisible and the two is divisible. Whenever the Pythagoreans referred to the number two, they spat on the ground to cleanse their mouths of the word, because to them all duality was error. Yet we live by duality. We go shopping by duality. We try to choose among fifty different detergents which one is the inevitably best. We have a hard time because every manufacturer is advertising his product as the best. And the Pythagorean would explain to us very clearly that the truth of the matter will probably lies in the fact that half of the detergents, which each one is better than the other, half of them are manufactured by the same company. So that you have beneath <coughs> these differences the fact that essentially they are identical. And nearly all of the differences are imaginary. Yet persons can become addicted to these imaginary differences and swear for the rest of their lives that one product is infinitely superior to the others. Also, persons living in different areas may find the hardness of water uh, a reason why one detergent might be more successful for them than another. But essentially, all say, serve the same purpose. And the competition is artificial. All division, all comparison, all competition in nature is artificial. It may not be among man-made products always, but in nature it is. Because in nature, the realities are never in competition to each other.
they are always complementary. So the uh, Pythagoreans and the Hindus both pointed out the importance of creating a unity and making this unity primary and allowing diversity to arise in this unity but never permitting the unity to be divided. The human mind, working with truth and error, uh, tried, of course, to tie it to a principle of good and a principle of bad. And we had theolog theological speculation in which God and the devil were locked forever in the struggle for the human soul. Uh, this attitude is essentially fruitless. It contributes nothing to the final enlightenment of man. Actually, the discovery of the reality of the thing ends all concern about its uh, truth or its error, or its reality or its illusion. Illusion is simply a misunderstanding of a thing. It is an appearance which in some way has been misinterpreted because the individual does not have the skill or the wisdom or the insight to interpret it correctly. The Buddhists are not too certain, however, that the tendency to illusion is essentially natural. They think that the tendency to misinterpret is founded upon some perversity in man's own character. They do not believe, that is the Buddhists, that man will go on year after year, generation after generation, misunderstanding the obvious, simply because he is incapable of understanding. They are convinced that man misunderstands because of a machinery which he has set up in himself. That in a sense his misunderstandings are intentional, although he does not realize it. They believe that the individual is clinging to an illusion because he wants to, not because he has to. That there is some perversity in his own makeup that causes him to prefer error to truth. Now, what would be the cause of such perversity? One cause of it would be an, un, an unbalanced attitude toward life itself, an, a lack of grasp of value concerning life. And uh, theory as related to this is quite different from practice. The person has a tendency to live immediately. He has a tendency to create a powerful partnership between his uh, ego or his self-center and his environment. He wants as much as he can have for himself now. He wants all the comforts, securities, prosperities, advantages possible now. He wants to build a success immediately in this world. He wishes to dominate, lead, and influence other people. He wants recognition, he wants applause, he wants advancement, and he wants his own way. All these put together would be quite inconceivable if the individual honestly examining the universe realized that this was not the purpose for his own existence. If the individual was not able to justify his false attitudes, he could not hold them. Therefore, he must justify them. And the only way he can justify them is by distorting the universe around him. He must refuse to see certain things. He must misinterpret some of the things he does see. He must depend heavily upon false evidence. He must agree with people not because they are right or that he thinks they are right, but because he chooses to assume they are right, inasmuch as by so doing he justifies himself. Thus in Buddhism, the problem of uh, error or illusion rises from the person's own subjective desire to do as he pleases and to sacrifice always reality for the sake of expediency. It is very doubtful if a man like Julius Caesar, sitting down quietly, 
could think through his own career without realizing that he was wrong. He could not uh, have gradually moved his own career to the uh, crisis in which he died at the foot of Pompey's statue with the dagger of his best friend in his heart. Caesar could not have experienced this tragedy had he honestly used his mind. Julius Caesar was no fool. He was no coward. He was a brilliant leader, a very astute politician, and a very ambitious man. These various pressures, with their conflicts, should have enabled him to know what must happen. Yet he chose to ignore the very judgment that he possessed. The same is true of Napoleon I. Napoleon was not a foolish man in the sense of common knowledge. He was a skillful leader, beloved by his armies. He was a brilliant strategist. And yet he should have known, and must have known, had he thought things through, that the end had to be disaster. Why did he go on? Why did Hitler go on? Why did Mussolini go on? fully aware that disaster was inevitable. The answer is only one thing, and that is the fulfillment of immediate desire. And that moment of glory that leads but to the grave was the most important thing. Mussolini said that he would rather live five years as a lion than twenty years as a lamb, and he had his choice. But he knew in his own heart that the chances were overwhelming that he would end in disaster. So the human being, having a degree of knowledge greater than his general tendency to guard and guide his career and character, chooses to forget what he knows and to keep his mind on impossible things. He is the victim of delusion illusion. Or as some have said, he is always strangely, superstitiously optimistic that although every person in history who has acted as he has acted has come to grief, his destiny will be different. We find this in family relationships. We find it everywhere. The individual cannot accept that the laws of common character and conduct apply to him. Buddhism and Greek philosophy also point out, therefore, that this confusion, this delusion, can only be overcome, can only be clarified by some kind of detachment. As long as the person is an absolute slave to his own ambitions, his own self-will, and the satisfaction of his own appetites, he will always come to disaster because he will break the rules. To find uh, what these rules are only by breaking them is a very long and painful procedure. Man does not have to grow every inch of the way from here to eternity in pain. He may choose to do so, but it is not necessary. There must be some way in which the individual can really gain the power within himself to live according to the best of himself. He must have some way in which he can return this highest authority to the best part of his own nature. Both the East and West, in the religious and philosophical systems which they developed, agree that this concept is correct. There is a way. And because it is very difficult for the person to fight all of his faults and every problem that may arise in him, especially in as much as he is not sure which are the faults. In some cases he knows, but in other cases they are rather complicated. 
The answer has always been that he must reduce pressures. Pressure leads to illusion. Pressure leads to error. The individual who is angry makes more mistakes. And in trying to bluff his way through one difficulty, he creates five new ones. He is like the man who cut off the dragon's head, and for every head he cut off, seven new ones appeared. This situation of trying to fight the tendency to error has never been successful, because man has not the necessary weapons. He does not have that sword of quick detachment referred to in the Bhagavad Gita. He simply has another dull weapon with which to defend himself against his own errors. So in these different systems of thinking, the only answer seemed to be to reduce as far as possible those aspects of life which have to depend upon error for their attractiveness or their continuance. The person who is not overly pressured <coughs> by false values has a chance of discovering true values. The moment he stops making mistakes, the processes of life begin to be more obvious to him, the real processes. When he stops making mistakes, he begins to get over being ignorant. And when his ignorance is all exhausted and gone, then his wisdom remains. For the struggle is against the immediate errors of the personality and the deep subjective realities which lie within consciousness itself. So in the uh, Eastern philosophy, particularly in the old Hindu and Vedic rites, the individual offered up his entire personal life to the service of the infinite, reserving nothing for himself and permitting the infinite life to manifest through him according to its own will. Now, today, a person who did a thing of this nature would probably find himself in many difficulties and would also be ridiculed by other people because he lives in a time in which false values are supreme and true values re represent uh, very little which are attractive to man. The true person, the, the thoughtful person, almost ne inevitably has to retire from human society and live in a monastic or isolated way. But for many individuals, the gradual reduction of pressure results in a continual increase of enlightenment, so a slow, balanced change of personal polarization. The pr real purpose, of course, being to realize that in a sense truth and error are at two ends of a scale. And the point of equilibrium is the reality. That the real thing is always in balance, whereas the unreal things are always opposed to each other. Polarity itself, while a manifestation of existence, is not as high a manifestation as the fact or reality of unity. Unity is oneness, and all things in truth and essence and substance must be considered as one. To be one in yourself, you have only two ways are possible. One is to gather up all of your parts and make a unit out of them. And the other is to relax away from the power of parts until the basic unity reveals itself. In meditative disciplines, therefore, the uh, mystic simply relaxes the disunity of his objective nature. He simply allows his ambitions, his attitudes, his desires, his feelings, his antagonisms to go to sleep. And in the sleeping of the divided parts, he experiences the basic unity that remains. But what is, then, this basic unity? What is this reality, uh, which in some way must bind up the wounds caused by the conflicts of polarities? 
the uh, nearly the only answer that uh, the, well, the wise have ever been able to give for this is that this quietude is peace. That it is something in which man becomes aware of the possibility of a non-polarized existence. He discovers that as long as he holds his attitudes in suspension, he is no longer torn by them. He is no longer fragmented by these different uh, pressures of his own nature. He also discovers that part of the answer is the intrinsic wisdom in him. In some way, we have a feeling that if the world was governed by the right people, it would be a peaceful, happy world. That if there was enough wisdom, enough understanding, enough love, enough insight in leaders, they could win and hold the devotion of their peoples, and that these various party conflicts are not ultimately necessary in government. In the same way, if some part of man, deep within himself, uh, could be given authority over the rest, there would no longer be conflicts of thoughts and emotions. There would no longer be pressures for and against realities. There would no longer be a terrible tugging toward illusion. The individual would not want to sell his birthright for the bowl of uh, pottage. He would not want these things if his own leadership was real. So the uh, Easterner took the attitude of trying to find the part of self that was big enough to bind all the other parts together, to unite them. In uniting them, perhaps merely enlightening them on the ground that the enlightened part will cooperate. The benighted part will compete. Non-cooperation uh, with a, a true inner leadership can only mean lack of insight. The uh, religious system that was created out of this theory, the meditational approach to life, therefore caused the yoga, yogin or the Vedantic student uh, to try to penetrate into himself to a condition of samadhi. Samadhi involved a number of achievements. Uh, first of all, the student of it had to become body unconscious. He assumed a certain posture or a sauna. He assumed a posture in which the body was neither under tension nor without tension, because always in equilibrium the release is achieved. If the individual is too comfortable, there is no release. If he is too uncomfortable, there is no release. So the asuras or body postures of the, of the yoga <coughs> disciplines were intended to achieve the possibility of the person losing awareness of body. So in meditation, in yoga, first of all, the body ceases to exist. Incidentally, the same procedure is described in the uh, Maha Paranavana Sutra relating to the death of Buddha. He is described as passing through these stages to achieve the final liberation. But in the Vedanta system, or in yoga, uh, the body awareness ceases. Now what does this mean? How are we going to experience this in terms of truth and error, of reality and illusion? Uh, when the body consciousness ceases, uh, what happens uh, to the true consciousness? Well, the descriptions that are best available on this type of subject from those who have uh, uh, experienced them would point out that as the body ceases, the, bo the world body ceases. As soon as consciousness is directed away from body focus, the individual ceases to know himself as a body. He is no longer sitting on the earth as a body or in a chair. The earth, his body, and every element involved in human physical material existence, every objective procedure, 
ceases. The community disappears. The nation disappears. The world disappears as far as its physical constitution is concerned. And the meditating mystic experiences himself as a conscious being without body, without form, merely a powerful spark of awareness in space. Now, well, some have said that this is a form of auto-hypnosis, that it is merely a technical method for denying the existence of material life. The organ, however, will never admit this. He will simply tell you uh, that where your focus of attention is, there you live, there your problems are, there your difficulties arise, and there your struggles continue. And that actually, this entire world in which we exist is much like that described in Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, which to the ignorant are the greatest reality. The objective focusing of attention upon matter. The moment that you bestow everything you have to the external, the external world rises as a magnificent image. The moment you dismiss this image by detachment, it disappears. So the yogin also points out, whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, whether you want to accept it or not, this is exactly what happens when you die. For when you die, you do not have the experience of the world and you departing from it. It is the world that departs. Suddenly, this whole mysterious pageantry simply evaporates, and you are exactly the same, and you're watching a world disappear. The reason being, your own center of, co of consciousness has shifted, and where it has shifted, a new world appears. Where it is removed, the old world disappears. For all these things are nothing but emphases. It is quite conceivable, in fact, some of our you know, university professors today are quite certain it is true, that if man could shift consciousness about through a series of tuning-ins and tuning-outs, he might discover a hundred different civilizations right here at the same time, that this very space around us is filled with other kinds of life, just as real as our own but not existing to us because we do not tune it in. So that uh, tuning in makes it real. Tuning out causes it to disappear. But anything that can be tuned in or tuned out is not inevitably true. It cannot be completely so. It is a relative thing. And in this relationship of tuning in and tuning out, the only reality conceivable is the radiant spark that does it. This spark, then, knows itself to continue in the midst of everything else that is changing. So a little later, the Vedantist, or the Yogan, having disintegrated, so to say, the material world, so far as he is concerned, he'll come back to it in due course. But for the moment, he is a spark in space. A spark, perhaps, that is tremendously thrilled. This new experience suddenly uh, causes almost an ecstasy within the self. The individual liberated from this little tiny uh, cocoon, which we call a body, suddenly feels the presence of infinite things. It thrills to the music of the spheres. It thrills to the infinite diversity of sidereal color. It is picked up in a strange dance of life. And the being says to itself, at last I'm beginning to experience something of these vast realities. And I now discover that I live in a world of light and color and feeling and beauty, of motion, 
of art, of music, of everything you can think of. And then slowly in the meditation, the yogin works his way through this mysterious enchantment. For this other enchantment is also part of a world through which he must pass. It is the magic garden of desires, a fulfillment of desires. It is a magic garden in which the individual says, if I can only be happy, everything is well. But this isn't the answer either, because wherever happiness exists, unhappiness must also ultimately come in. As Omar says, the Lord with paradise devised the snake. That it always has to be there. So gradually this wonderful world of feeling goes to sleep also. And the yogin suddenly discovers that he has no longer any moods, any feelings. He does not know or care whether he ever has joy again or not. His emotions go to sleep in some kind of a strange rational certainty. He begins to experience this pure mentation, the mentation of everything being sufficient because it is so, because it is true, because it is real. The mentation which experiences all things in terms of logic and of pure reason a reason far above anything that we know in this world, a reason which seems to reach out for the first time to the total understanding of existence. And this little spark is still there, this little spark that is going to understand all things and experiences more and more within itself the strange unfoldment of an infinite wisdom a wisdom that gives comprehension of all things. And still the yogin is fighting his way. He thinks, as some might think he has arrived, but he knows he has not. That as long as he remains as an observer, as long as there is some kind of a boundary between himself and that which is to be understood, he is not quite there. No matter how much he knows, how much he observes, he is still an observer. No matter how much he contemplates, there is still himself and that which he contemplates. There is still this mysterious interval of total experience which he has not passed. So finally in samadhi, uh, the yogin voluntarily relinquishes the self that is the seeker. He not only relinquishes his desire to know, he relinquishes his need to know. He relinquishes his instinctive right to know. He relinquishes his mental satisfaction in knowing. He is striving to get past this polarized existence. He is looking for the only answer, which is the final end of conflict. To end conflict, he must destroy the interval between me and thee. He must overwhelm the interval between himself and God. He must also break through that mysterious wall that divides relative error from absolute truth. He has to get through there some way. There's only one way he can do it, and that is to allow the self, which is the divider, to go to sleep so that gradually he must take this supreme step of absolute faith. He must relinquish his own right to exist. He must lose his life in God if he is to save his life. Jesus said, who loses his life for my sake shall have life everlasting. And it is this voluntary relinquishing of self-existence that suddenly causes the individual to escape totally from polarized consciousness. Now you might say, yes, but when the individual has made this relinquishment, he has then lost, ultimately, all control over his own destiny. This is not true in samadhi. It may be true in the Buddhist Mahaparanavana. Well, that is the road of no return. But in the samadhi, 
the individual, the uh, yogin, experiences the sleep of truth. Now, in sleep, we lose control. We forget we exist. We have no self-existence. And yet, in the morning, we awake. Therefore, the laws of self-consciousness is not proof, per se, of loss of existence. A very important point in Buddhism. It is not necessary for man to experience himself in order to exist. Sleep proves this in a very simple way. Sleep proves that existence continues, that self-existence is merely a, an interrupted process within the substance of a total existence. Samadhi, therefore, is the rejection or the relinquishing of self-existence by yoga. The individual thereby becoming one with existence. From this experience, there is, however, a certain difference with sleep. Because sleep, of course, is a natural phenomenon due to exhaustion and natural cycles of rehabilitation. We cannot carry the analogy too far. But in the case of absolute samadhi, the individual has a dimension of experience which cannot be defined here. He exists without self-existence. He is in a unified condition with absolute knowledge and absolute being without a sense of his own personal consciousness. He is no longer an observer. He is no longer something accepting or receiving into himself. He is diffused in the very essence of absolute unification. He has achieved the true meaning of yoga, which is union. He is one with the beloved, as the Muslim mystic would say. So he discovers in this truth. He discovers, as the old... Uh, school of Cairo, the great um, Egyptian Muslim mystic school, realized that beyond all knowing is the mysterious and dramatic truth that all knowing is a kind of genteel lunacy. That the only thing that is real is this state that transcends knowing and divides polarized existence from total life. If this uh, is difficult to attain, it is almost equally difficult to describe. Those who have attempted to describe it have simply fallen back upon the concept of a great infinite peace, an ocean of serenity, an end of all doubt and all fear and all emergency, a timelessness a rest full of action, a dynamic suspension of effort, a Zen type of thing. Not that the individual simply passes into a state of infinite reward, as in some heaven, or into the nothingness which is the atheist's hope. It is rather that the individual becomes one with an ever-moving, ever-growing, ever-unfolding eternity. But there is no longer any actual separateness. And the entity remains in this state for a time. But in the samadhi problem, this time is rhythmic. A man finds that as he has not yet fully attained this condition, that he is not able to fully maintain it. That is the cyclic law that brings him back. Because it is not his true state. He may achieve it temporarily. But having lost in the highest phase of samadhi, self-directive, he suddenly can no longer press on to the maintenance of this state. He therefore experiences it and slips back again 
into objectivity. He drops back again into mental awareness, then into emotional awareness, then into physical re-awareness, and awakens from his meditation. He has sort of uh, gone on a space ship through conditions as far as the fuel would take him. And then the fuel having failed, he drops back again. He cannot stay there because he is not able to perpetually maintain his attitude. No, the attitude not being as yet fully his nature. But out of this experience which saints and mystics have recorded in many countries and under many situations, there comes the uh, psychic background for man's realization or belief that truth is unpolarized. That uh, actually the uh, realities we seek are complete unities, complete wholenesses, and that all mental processes which polarize do separate man from truth. We have overworked the physical sensations to bind us to materiality. We have overworked the emotional sensations uh, to by binding us to the gratification of appetites. We have overworked the intellectual faculties, binding ourselves to a universe of uh, intellectual, educational, industrial, economic achievements. We have assumed that each of these ends was the answer. We have assumed that with our intellect we can storm the gates of heaven, that we can think our way to everlasting glory, and we cannot because the mind will always be polarized, will always be immersed in the ignorance around itself and within itself. You have to transcend the faculties. And the highest kind of wisdom that we can know in this world is that which comes from ages of experience, by which we come to learn in the end that wisdom is not in this world. This is that type of point that we made in the beginning, that the beginning of wisdom is always in the recognition of ignorance. The recognition of the fact that we are wrong must always be the beginning of the realization that we are right. It is always by this reverse procedure. So in this world we have truth and error. We have error which is nothing more or less than an inadequate degree of truth. We have truth as we know it in this world, which is simply a, a gradual recovery from a condition of dis discomforting error. We have truths and errors that change and twist and turn with every facet of human life and growth. We have discoveries that make the truths of one generation the errors of another. It goes on and on and on. But always it is polarized. Always it is the result of a duality of procedures. Somewhere we have to break through this. We have to uh, recognize various patterns the ancients discovered. The pattern of spirit and matter, each only an aspect of the other. That actually there is only one substance, and the polarization arises in it, not in itself essentially, but in man's effort to interpret it. We have no proof whatever that the gnat in the sunbeam is any less in the cosmos than a planet or a sun. We do not know this. We only assume it. We also realize that good and evil uh, are not at all clearly marked as we think they are. That good may be the least degree of evil, evil the least degree of good. We never have any realization of how these policies operate. But we are convinced that the so-called opposites are by degrees, that the Gnostics were correct in their theory of emanationism, in which superior forces moving downward in emanating arcs, meeting inferior forces ascending in emanating arcs, uh, created constant compounds of reality and illusion. And that in these various compounds, one band emerges from man and the other radiates from heaven. Man is ever in some kind of an adjustment, therefore, between himself and that which is superior to himself. 
So if you want to try to make some kind of a little practical mm -hmm. program out of this and get it out of the sky entirely and down into your own particular problems, you may ask yourself, what is the truth of, about some of the common things with which you are constantly working? Uh, what, is the, what is the truth, for example, uh, in the relationships between yourselves and other people? A very common problem. Uh, you may say, I have a son. He's my boy. I'm mighty proud of him. The, very, the first problem is, is he your boy? From a physical standpoint, yes. And uh, according to physical laws, he is your son. But the moment you press this so-called truth too far, it leads to a dangerous error. The moment you think of a person as your son, it is very difficult not to take an authoritarian attitude toward that person. If it's yours, it is your right to use as you please. If it's yours, you have the right to control it, the right to create its destiny for it. If it's yours, you have the right to say what profession it will follow, what art or craft it will follow, who it will marry, where it will live, what it will do with its money. These are all your rights if it is yours. But the moment you begin to live with this, you realize you don't have those rights. If you force those rights, you will destroy your son. You will change him into something that neither you nor anyone else could be proud of. But after that boy is, your, is yours for a while, you discover that a selfness is arising in that son. That ultimately this son is going to belong to himself and not to you. So your tr the truth that you started with, that it was your boy, slowly changes. And you have to face the ultimate fact that the boy belongs to himself. What is your relation to this boy, then? According to body, you help to create that body. According to the person in the body, you are not the father of that person. That person belongs to itself, just as you belong to yourself, and as your father belonged to himself. Thus, this idea that children are simply the progeny of their parents while it is apparently justifiable biologically, falls apart completely psychologically. So here's a half-truth. Here's a partial truth. When the child is a month old, it isn't old enough to bring your truth into question. Therefore, your truth stands. When it is ten years old, your truth still stands in part, but it is weakening. And by the time he is 20 years old, your truth begins to fall apart. Therefore, why not find out what the truth of the matter was in the first place? The truth of the matter is exactly as Buddha would have pointed out. This child is not your son. And at the same time, this child is not, not your son. Because it depends upon the time, the situation, the condition. Under certain situations at certain times, it is your son. If this boy is injured, even though he may be a man of 40 years old, your sorrow, your consolation, your help goes out to him. He is still your son. If this boy, however, goes his own way and succeeds and has his own life and never needs you, he is your son, but he is not your son. He is still of your blood, but unless he calls upon your parenthood, the relationship of the father and son gets very thin and finally disappears entirely in the maturity of things. So the real matter is that always and forever, father and son are united in something else, life. In a mysterious way, Father and Son are one being. But in that one being are all fathers and all sons. So that actually all that lives is one being. 
taking an infinite diversity of manifested relationships. The stranger and the enemy and the friend and the son are all relationships set up by conditions in life. But all of these different persons arise from one. In substance, they are one. Consequently, there can be nothing but identity at the source of life. All other relationships are passing. To realize the identity is to meet all the needs. To accept any of the relationships without recognizing the identity is to shortchange something. Therefore, the son who is yours at the same time belongs to himself. But the himself to which he belongs and the yourself to which you belong are two manifestations of one eternal self to which we all belong. But if we do not get that higher point clear, all of our secondary relationships fall apart. The polarized selves below are in trouble and conflict forever, unless the unpolarized over-self, the Atman, is recognized as the basis of all true relationship. All relationship is actually identity. All things are one thing. Within this identity, we can then set up any other relationships we want to, and they will always be compatible. But without the realization of the over-identity, all other relationships become illusionary. So illusionary relationships are those in which facts are explained incorrectly, or in which the wrong evidence is used to prove the right thing. The man says, I and my son, in a sense, we are one person. We understand each other. He is my blood. He is the continuance of myself into the future. This is fine as far as it goes, but it can lead to the most selfish possessiveness the world has ever known. Because in this there is no true insight. But if this man can realize that actually he and his son are two eternal manifestations of eternal being, then all the other relationships become the basis of fair, friendly understanding. It's the same point again with the Indic theory of family. In this country, a mother will say, I have given everything to my children, therefore it is now their duty to take care of me. This is a perfectly reasonable interpretation of the ancient Mosaic Code but was also a very learned rabbi of Talmudic virtues who on one occasion pointed out that it is more difficult for twelve sons to take care of one mother than it is for one mother to raise twelve sons. There is this difference. In India, the situation is reversed. The mother says, when I have raised my sons, I have paid my debt to my mother. It goes back instead of forward. In other words, the child is always the, re is the fulfillment of the duty to pay for our own upbringing. The child is therefore allowed to be free, in a sense, because we have paid our debt by bringing this child up. It is not the child who has contracted a debt. It is the parent who has paid a debt. But let the child remember, when it has a child, that the same rule will apply. But the difference is psychological, and yet these are two interpretations of one obvious fact. Which is the illusion? Which is the reality? How are we going to judge all of these differences? The real fact of it, of course, lies again behind. Namely, that the universe is infinite growth. 
Therefore, all things have the common responsibility of growing. If man lived only once and was brought into this life only as the result of the attitudes of parents, then perhaps the parent would be fully responsible. But actually, we are part of an eternal generating process. And philosophy and oriental thinking says, factually, there is no responsibility. There is no duty. But there is an all-enclosing graciousness. There is always the wonderful privilege of helping to bring life into life. These things are not duties. They are the gracious ways in which we share together those who brought us into the world, those we bring into the world. It is a wonderful comradeship of purposes. Nobody owns anybody. Nobody needs to. There is only one owner, and that is the master of the show, that which is behind it all, the eternal power. And all things that grow, generate, build, are merely manifesting this divine power. It is the gracious possibility of life, therefore, to fulfill the natural laws of its creator. Not because it has to, although maybe it does, but not because it has to feel that it has to. Rather, that to feel, rather than that it should feel that through the fulfillment it worships. Uh, through the doing of gracious and beautiful things, it glorifies the graciousness and beauty which sustains existence. These patterns, therefore, pull together, always hunting for unity, always seeking for the basic principle that is so big that it takes all the conflict out of secondary principles and enables us to restore them to their proper honor. Though we may not be correct entirely in all of our unities, we are not absolutely sure of some of these things. But one thing we are relatively certain, namely that we are advancing in the right direction when we remove destructive polarities. Whenever we find a source of understanding, we have grown. Whenever we create a source of misunderstanding, we have retrograded. Whenever as the result of our decision we have a better world, we are moving in the right direction. We may not be at the final decision. Perhaps there are understandings far beyond us. But that which overcomes dualities by putting a sovereign unity above them, this is the next step toward knowing, toward the fulfillment of knowing. This is better than what we knew before. This was better than the previous standard by which we lived. We also have the power to know that truth Whatever truth degree we possess helps something. Truth will never cause things to become worse. Truth may discomfort us, but it will only be our selfishness that is discomforted. Wherever a truth is practiced, there is a certain strength resulting from it, a security, a betterment for all value. Wherever an illusion is practiced, something must go wrong. There is a loss of ground. There is a rise of differences. But wherever an error comes into existence, there is a loss of insight. Wherever we make a mistake, a prejudice raises its head. Wherever we use the best virtue that we possess, a freedom is achieved from prejudice or deceit or conceit or whatever may be the difficult factor. By watching this alone, we can gradually guide our way in the direction of greater realizations. Always they produce a better fruit. Always they lead to a happier ending. 
Now, in the world today, we have tremendous conflicts, more than ever before in history. And many persons have got to work out these conflicts some way within themselves, or be torn to pieces by their own tensions and stress. Tension is simply conflict. Tension is polarized energy fighting with itself. Pressure is reality and unreality locked in some kind of a situation in which actually reality is simply present and unreality is fighting this presence. Reality never fights anything, but unreality is always fighting. Reality does not need to fight. Truth can never be assailed successfully, therefore it never need to be defended. It may need only to be achieved, to be accomplished as an experience within life. Everywhere these tensions arise, it's because the individual is living better in one area and worse in another. He sees a certain amount which leads him on to a higher way of life. He is trying desperately, however, to overlook some kind of a quality of character that is good in order that he may accommodate some character of quality that is not good. So the individual who knows in his own heart and soul that he should be temperate drinks too much. Not because he does not know better, but because he lacks the courage to do that which he knows. He is finding constant excuses to perpetuate his error. Another individual knows in his heart that his religion calls for peaceful understanding of other people. Yet he cannot achieve this. He is constantly, subjectively, instinctively combating. These are his polarities, and they are tearing him to pieces. This is the thing that has torn Christendom apart for nearly 20 centuries. Jesus left his admonition to his disciples. If ye love me, love one another. This was the doctrine. But men could not live it. They could not love one another. It demanded something they could not provide. Because if you love another person, you can't cheat them. And cheating is very profitable. If you love people, you must be kind, and people feel like being unkind. So little by little, the great doctrine dropped back to become a conscience mechanism. The doctrine which actually is very near to a great truth, near to a universal reality, love ye one another. This became subjectified, along with many other beautiful concepts, along with the Ten Commandments, along with the Code of Justinian, all the great systems of moral instruction, along with the Institutes of Manu, the great Hindu Book of the Law. All of these great Code revelations were just too much for the individual who still wanted to nurse his littleness. And after having nursed his littleness for a long time, he discovers tension. The tension is life within him, an eternal life, a good life, trying to manifest through something that wants to misrepresent it morning, noon, and night. Whenever this life forms a beautiful reality in us, we begin to cut this reality down to shape. We begin, we begin to try to distort it until it fits some little purpose of our own. We go into all kinds of procedures. We legislate and we create groups of people who are going to all agree that a certain right is wrong. We're going to do anything, but we cannot defeat this mysterious vibratory rate in ourselves, the rate which is ourselves, the rate of harmony, of peace. Inside of us is something, the vibration of which is peace. Perhaps the vibration itself is truth. But whatever it is, 
it cannot be refused. And this vibration moving out against our self-centeredness turns the life of the average person into a battlefield in which the good in him, which by its own radiance is a light that is there, nothing can be done about it. It is there. It cannot be taken away. But around this light man builds all kinds of distorting structures. The light breaks through these structures, and as it breaks through, the individual is hurt. The light suddenly casts itself into some dark area of conduct, revealing the facts, and the individual is hurt. Everywhere this struggle, therefore, between truth and error, between reality and illusion, is the struggle between life and mind, emotion, body resisting life. Mind says, I will interpret life as I please, and it had better be what I say it is. So life remind, remains exactly what it is and beats the mind. Emotions say, I'm taking life, I'm going to make life do what I want it to. I shall use life to fulfill desire. Life takes over this emotional pattern and punishes it, because the pattern is wrong. The pattern cannot sustain itself. Life will never do what this pattern requires. Therefore, the person is miserable. The body says, I will do as I please. I will... Uh, break all the natural rules of health. I will take the energy which has been given to me and I will waste this energy. But I still demand the right to be healthy. In nature, with its energy and its life, cannot be touched by these demands. Life fulfills its purpose. Body is broken if it opposes life. So everywhere, the uh, error is the individual breaking faith with life, law, pattern, truth. And this breaking of faith creates a separateness, isolates the person from the universal. Only when the person acknowledges error, returns to the universal, and establishes itself in the eternal nature, can unity be reestablished. God has not departed from man. Man attempted to depart from God, but could not do it. For every part of man is also God. Therefore, man, in his willfulness, tried to establish his own empire in a universal empire. He became a small, discontented minority. He became a kind of universal beatnik, and as a result, he's in trouble. He has to go back to the rules. The polarities he has set up have no existence except within his own confusion. For he has found there are two ways of doing things wrong. These are the polarities. And only one way of doing them right, and that is equilibrium. And he has found that the only way in which he can reconcile himself with the infinite is through the realization or restatement of the experience of unity in which there is no longer polarized consciousness. This was the burden of Zen. This is the teaching of the Sufis. This was the instinctive realization of the Quakers and the Friends. It has also been the mystical revelation that has guided the saints and sages since the dawn of time. Consequently, we are seeking still to bring all polarized opposites into complete and perfect equilibrium. For the moment we achieve equilibrium, in that moment of absolute balance, reality moves in, takes over, and we are no longer subjected to this endless war between light and darkness. Reality alone is real. Light and darkness are its moods but they are held within the pattern of its righteousness. Man, not aware of the pattern, struggles to overcome the polarizations without any realization that these polarizations do not need to be overcome as we would do it. They merely, merely need to be realized through. It's the facts to be seen and the one or the 
the nearest thing to the infinite state of being that we can know, must be elevated above becoming. Becoming is all we know, but becoming takes place in being. While becoming is a struggle forever, we suffer. While becoming is recognized as a natural manifestation of being, being itself present in all of its own becoming, then we flow with life, flow with Tao, have a natural and gracious adjustment and a non-competitive relationship with each other and with the power that created us. Well, I think our time is up for this evening, so we'll try next week.